Okay, so I want to start today by, if you look up the top of the screen, you should see a new menu item, AI. Um, and if you click on that, you'll see, uh, hopefully, a list of AI names, Shoal, You Twice, Ginger, and Doctor. And you should see a green icon next to Doctor on the leftmost icon. So that icon, which is a microphone with a piece of paper, uh, is an indication that that AI can hear you via the transcription service. So it's uh, the voice chat. Whatever we say through voice chat is being transcribed and is visible to this agent. So this is the beginnings of uh, being more transparent about uh, how the AI services are integrated into the experience here at MediUni. Uh, this panel seems to let you do more. You can click on things like read and remember, and those don't actually do anything right now. So uh, this is... Uh, work in progress. So I want to describe what the idea around this is and uh, have this lead into a, uh, a more general discussion around not only privacy, but uh, the way Adam put it, uh, I, I liked, which is technological disruption often causes us to have to or wish to redraw boundaries around individuals, institutions, ideas like privacy. Uh, of course, who gets to redraw the boundaries and uh, who gets to choose whether to do it or not and who more or less gets forced to uh, some of the most contentious issues around the introduction of new technologies. And uh, I want to be very careful about how this is done here. Uh, because I see many potential upsides, but they could be easily derailed or go badly if people aren't very aware of what's happening and feel in control of what's happening. So um, this is surely one of the most important issues that will arise as AI progresses and steadily becomes pervasive. There's no stopping that. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can get it right here and I'd, I'd like your help in doing that. So um, I'll just talk you through what you can see on this privacy settings panel and the plan here and then um, you can comment on that or the broader issues. So right now you can't choose whether or not the agent hears you. That's technically a bit difficult. So if you're in a seminar and it's flagged as a seminar where the agents are listening, then that's just the way it is. You can, you can not speak or you can leave. Uh, once it once there's more of an API around the voice chat, I'll try and do more about that. But for now, that first column there, uh, you can't edit it. It's just a description of the state of affairs. The other two columns are up to you to edit. Yeah, that's right. That's another thing I'll comment on. So Roblox and also op OpenAI are out of our control. And as long as we're sending them information, they could be doing various things with that. You can pursue their privacy policies and decide to what degree you believe them. Um, so that's another a factor, important factor, that's right. So the, the read column here, uh, the way this will work is that if it's selected, then the AI um, can see the messages that you type in the chat. If that's not selected, then it just it's like you won't exist from the point of view of the text chat. The remember column is whether or not the agent forms memories of those interactions with you or the things you type. So uh, that includes your username. You might choose to do that because in future, you know, you come back in and it refers to a conversation you had. And the only way it really knows about that is by referring to your username, which it looks up in its memory. Um, or rather, it looks up the content of the conversations. So you may choose to do that or you, you may choose not to. Um, these will both be opt-in columns, which will be a bit awkward potentially. Um, I, I guess you might type to the AI and just it doesn't talk to you back. You might wonder why. So there needs to be some UI around that, but I think it's better for both of these columns to be opt-in. Um, yeah, so that's the idea for the moment for how it will work. And if you don't tick either of those, uh, then uh, the hearing doesn't refer to usernames. So uh, the agent just hears, the message it gets is that somebody said blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. A technical question. Mm. Um, so with the memory thing, um, is it just that basically the messages are 
um, stripped from the log. I mean, it's, the messages obviously have an impact on the conversation, and that's like a side channel through which memory could correct go through. Like, let's say you say to the AI, "Repeat after me," blah blah blah, and then it says that your message is your message is removed. Its message stays. Yeah, that's correct. I I think there's that's one of the things I want to discuss. I mean, there's there's some kind of uh, reasonable i mean there are technical things i can do but beyond a certain point it's kind of there are things you give up by choosing to participate in a conversation right it's not a realistic expectation at least with people right so and maybe the ai should be treated differently to people because their memory is different and more permanent and and potentially scalable in a way that human memories aren't so these are all things that are relevant so I don't know actually where my attitude sits, but it's it's, it's also the AI memory is also more controllable and editable than a human is, though. Human beings can't be forced to forget things, but AI certainly could in principle. Mm. Yeah, so I think there's once you once you interact in a conversation, there are effects. Those effects happen on other people and their ideas, and through those changes, your ideas and your speech gets passed along. And past some degree of separation, it's no longer reasonable for you to expect to control that or to be able to recall that. Uh, so I don't know where that line is with the AIs, but the, the simple initial stage is simply that they won't record the direct things you say. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all clear, and I agree. Um, it's yeah. like, I just wanted to point out that it's like a little more complicated than absolutely, yeah, just a button, whether or not you remembered. And I think there is there is the potential for misunderstanding, right? I mean, people could, especially, I think people who are technically literate sort of get what's difficult and what's not and may not have unrealistic expectations. But uh, if you're not deeply into this tech, uh, you may see that remember thing and think that if it's off, then basically nothing you say, no aspect of it will be recalled by the system. And that might be an unrealistic expectation. So... I think those kinds of things, maybe we can do something to spell them out. Pre probably people won't read it. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of communication work to do around these um, kinds of things. Um, yeah, let's continue. I, I want to hear more of your thoughts about that, but I, I want to put into the conversation also on the positive side of the ledger, the reason to do this in the first place, right? There are downsides. Uh, I believe there are also upsides and the the goal is to capture some of the upside while avoiding as many as possible of the downsides. Um, the advantages that I see here are something like the following. So there are many channels for ideas to make their way from my mind to your mind. Uh, one of them is conversation. Um, there are many others. I could write a book. You could read the book. I could record a podcast. You could hear the podcast. I could make a video. You could watch the video. Uh, I could write a play, you could sit and watch the play, etc, etc. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me that quite soon, and going forward, perhaps a predominant way that my ideas will make it to you is by them being packaged in various forms of intelligence of varying degrees. So a podcast will come with an interface that you can ask questions to, and it may be more or less kind of creative or stitching, filling in the gaps, using other information in order to give those answers. It might be a continuum all the way from just like literal text search through to uh, kind of quite broad extrapolation based on other things the speaker has said and so on. And there will be many things along that continuum we'll interact with. And they will come with many problems um, but I think the advantages will be so profound that this will be something people will do a lot. Uh, and I, I think I can see, maybe not with the current systems, uh, they're still quite limited. But uh, as these things improve, uh, this will, I, th I think, be something quite desirable and really increase the rate at which we interact with each other's ideas. So I'm... You know, I have the advantage of Adam's my friend, right? So I can kind of just email him anytime and be like, hey, here's a stupid thing. What do you think about that? Um, 
you probably feel shy to do that, although probably Adam would reply to your email. Um, so there's some sense in which people will be much more willing to interact with ideas when there's less friction and interacting with people is great, but comes with friction, time zones for one, um, bandwidth limits on people's attention for another. So I can see a lot of potential for having this be a, a great way of deepening people's interaction with ideas. Uh, but yeah, the, the downsides need to be elaborated and thought through and mitigated. So yeah, I'll stop speaking now and uh, invite comments on that. The, well, we could, sorry, go ahead. I'm just gonna say that the spectrum that you outlined is interesting. So I'm thinking there's like um, having no contact with someone, having some kind of like static contact with them, which is like a recording of a lecture or a book that they've um, presented it you just followed the the order that they've presented it in then it's sort of like picking and choosing what you read um based on like being able to search for keywords or something like that and then there's uh having a conversation with them uh, yourself where you you kind of get to pick and choose what to prompt out of them and then coming in between those last two levels is maybe something in between that hasn't existed before which is an intelligent kind of um copy of a person i mean it's in sci-fi a lot um some kind of uh some kind of scan of a person's beliefs in the same way that a book is like a uh um a kind of model of, of a certain part of a person's thinking um crystallized into into text maybe instead of like becoming a youtuber people in the future will like create these um Oh, yeah, or a YouTuber or an author, people will create these um, semi-static, semi-dynamic copies of certain ideas and then publish them. Yeah, it's interesting, just to elaborate on that, there are a number of examples in science fiction where versions of a person or part of their mind becomes, is, is extricated and uh, turned into some interactive construct. I've seen that. I'm trying to think of an of, of an example in Star Trek because we had fun trying to point out how many interesting ideas were anticipated and used within the storytelling of that of that you know fictional universe. But I can't think of one that comes immediately to mind that's exactly that idea. The one that's kind of stuck in my mind to say um, there is a character like that in the movie I Robot. It's about 20 years old now, so it anticipated it reasonably well. And um, uh, I can actually remember thinking, well, this doesn't sound very, that doesn't seem intuitively very plausible to me when I saw it at the time. And of course, in retrospect, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. And I think there are classic examples, much older in science fiction. Ah, yeah, Neuromancer is a good, good yes, yeah, a good example. I think even, um, if you go back to sort of the golden age, Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein may have had some um, some examples of this. So it's interesting that it's that it's the idea that you could take a, 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 a fraction of a person's thinking or mind and make that a construct with which other people might interact. It's interesting that that's an old idea. It does perhaps in itself, the fact that that idea is old may lend credence to Matt's other point about books effectively being Hmm. A, a, a an example of that. Um, so maybe we sort of have a a tacit understanding that we're already experiencing this when we encounter text that others have laid down. And then the the other uh, thing I'll mention there is that I I, I know of two specific individuals uh, who are who for a very long time have been ex explicit in this idea and incorporating it into their own lives. And those two people are uh, Ray Kurzweil and Stephen Wolfram, and both of them have made quite a, uh, not a show of it, but they, they, they've been at least explicit to their various audiences, explaining that they meticulously and frankly quite obsessively document all of their own work and output and thinking uh, with the specific idea that at, at, that at some point in the future, that body of text, which primarily text, perhaps some other materials, 
will be able to be used to uh, reconstruct them um, or some version of their personality. And Ray Kurzweil is also famous for hoping that he has enough documentation of his father's to uh, effectively resurrect a, a personality construct uh, some sort of simulacrum of, of, his, of his father who died a long time ago. So these, these are ideas that I think quite have been taken quite seriously and, and by quite thoughtful people for a variety of different reasons, from storytelling and entertainment to, you know, very quite, really quite serious, uh, uh, you know, academic purposes. Um, and so I, 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 there may be a space here to explore. This may be not completely uncharted territory. There may be a space here to explore uh, a literature to investigate and see what other thinking is out there about this. See if there are any other um, folks who've developed some good ethical or moral or other practical uh, ideas around what it would mean to be interacting with a version of somebody. And just to circle back and connect this to the, the topic of privacy and security, one could imagine at the complex ethical issues arising when other agents, humans and other intelligent agents are able to interact with part of a person, but not the entire authentic person. And what, what, and so, so when we're talking about needing to redraw boundaries, that, <laughs> the fact that constructs can, could exist, they capture a part of your mind, maybe they were, might be authorized, maybe they might be, you know, unauthorized, then the, we, that would be quite a radical redrawing of boundaries if, if, if our privacy were to extend to the things other people could do with information about us um, as far as interacting with our, like, would that be considered a violation to, to uh, have a conversation with somebody without their permission? It, it, it calls to mind something like, um, uh, what, are the, what are the moral and ethical obligations of how we interact with a person who is on, um, for example, a mind altering substance, like if they're not themselves, if they're not fully cognizant, then we have different standards for how we interact with, with a person. If, they, if they're under the influence of an anesthetic and are not going to remember the interaction, you know, that, that morally and ethically, that changes our obligations to that person. We can't expect that person to make certain decisions. Uh, we, would, we would consider it a violation of privacy to induce a person to disclose things um, it would be sort of under a form of duress. It would be under a, 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 a form of vulnerability that we would not normally find um, acceptable, right? And so this technology raises shadows of that, those same concerns. It's quite fascinating, really. When you, yeah, when maybe, you think maybe let me put a, a slightly different analogy there. So famous thinkers are often sort of their ideas uh, – sort of appropriated for other people's political purposes quite often, right? So the, the shadow of that author's ideas is in the, their texts. Nobody reads the books or very few people, but somebody quite charismatic can, can use the fame of an author in order to, and twist their words a little bit in order to set up a movement. Uh, that's, that's something that I guess most of us don't think about because uh, most of us aren't sufficiently famous to have that happen to us. But what if that could happen to anybody, essentially, right? So that uh, the ideas and thoughts that you've put out there in the world, I mean, you, you might at first be pleased that people interact with them and then horrified as they're misrepresented. Now, currently, the misrepresentation uh, seems like it's further removed from you uh, if somebody produces a simulacrum of you that seems quite authentic but misrepresents your actual view <laughs> you could you could easily find yourself in a position of having to argue with your simulacrum about what your real view is i guess <laughs> well it's it's funny a couple things come to mind there one is that uh we we i think we do sometimes have to face 
aspects of ourselves almost in dialogue. Maybe certain parts of psychotherapy involve elements of that. Uh, so I don't think it's that far fetched, really, to think that we might be interacting with parts of ourselves and not necessarily automatically have perfect concordance among in those interactions. That's the first thing. But just to flip things around, maybe with a more positive spin on the same idea that you were talking about, Dan, uh, one could imagine because these constructs could scale and uh, be potentially be accessible, we might also have a situation where uh, thanks to this technology, it would be very hard to put words in somebody else's mouth directly. So for example, today, you can make a claim about the meaning or the intentions of another person very easily, instantaneously. You can broadcast that because we have the broadcast capability on social media and other media. And you can, you can put words in somebody's mouth. And if enough people do that, then it can overwhelm the capacity of the actual person to respond and correct those misrepresentations. But if you could scale simulacra and have a, a bot, a, a version of yourself that was accessible to hundreds, thousands, millions of people simultaneously, then it would be much more difficult to mischaracterize a person with the background knowledge that uh, uh, the, 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 you, you can go straight to a more legitimate a source of truth about this person. And so a sanctioned, officially sanctioned simulacrum of yourself, if you were a, fam a famous person, for example, like you alluded to, Dan, so if you were a celebrity, you could have one of these running, and then you could defend yourself against people putting words in your mouth or misinterpreting you, because it, it could, one could imagine, it becoming just an expectation that, well, let's check with the let's check with Steven Pinker's bot and see if that's what he really meant about X, Y, or Z, right? And that might be a, a way in which to defend against uh, this. So, and, and of course, since there are, we're identifying multiple aspects, multiple sides, uh, then we could also potentially imagine an arms race between these two functions, right? Yeah, that sounds like um, press cause versus like, um... Yeah, public advanced. relations people yeah. in a press release <laughs> and actually I, I don't know if it's so like wh why can't people today come out and um, make a statement about something if, if they think their views have been represented it's because it can be difficult to defend your views and also if you uh, if you are specific you like open yourself up to that kind of criticism so I'm not so optimistic I guess that this would actually help in that kind of thing um, because um maybe people would be even more reluctant to release public access to their um, their um, bot version um, because I think it would sort of be subtly wrong in, in important ways um, than if they were sort of to handle it themselves and, and give a response. Hmm. Maybe, maybe it depends on the class of ideas. So maybe for some of your ideas, uh, you're open to this and for some others you aren't. I've noticed this with, I mean, maybe it also, uh, there's variation in how good the shadows are in representing various classes of ideas. So uh, we've been talking over the last week about these auto summaries, uh, if summary is even the right word, that GPT-3 is generated of um, seminars. For some seminars, it's, I think on average, it's uh, probably not useful um, in some cases, it's really quite good. Uh, in some cases, at least as good as what I would write. Maybe one out of five times it's like that. Uh, maybe three out of five times it's just a bit weird and misunderstands what's going on. The, the process of generating those summaries, just briefly, is that it looks through the transcript, which has all sorts of ums and ahs and so on in it. It's quite hard to read. Uh, it divides that into chunks of 2,500 words, roughly uh, 3,000 tokens. It asks GPT-3 to summarize those, and that's what's the long summary on those web pages, all those concatenated summaries. And then it summarizes the summaries and then summarizes the summaries and, and gets in the end to a kind of, in principle, a summary of the whole talk. Um, 
in principle, that, that should continue to improve the quality of those summaries. I've seen papers that claim that it's competitive with human summarization done properly uh, with instruction fine tuning and, and so on. So done more in a more sophisticated way than what I'm doing, I think it can be significantly better. But the general point stands, which is, uh, well, do you trust a human summarizer to completely get your views correct? At this point, you would trust it more than a machine. Uh, so that's still dead text on the page, but maybe it, it has a shade of the out of control feeling of having a shadow running around talking to people because if you're communicating a lot, I mean, if you're recording many seminars per week, you probably don't have the time to manually transcribe or manually check all the things you're saying, uh, but you might derive some benefit from having those transcripts available uh, for people to run into with search or just to to interact with your ideas and see what's happening there and as a first stage of interacting further. So I think there's probably many different, uh, like you can disaggregate this attempt to communicate with the world, right? And some channels you probably want to be very careful, right? And other channels, maybe you want to be less careful. Uh, so maybe it's not a matter of um, you have a, a single shadow that interfaces on all the things you care about. I want to raise something um, else. So it's, but it's a little bit related to, to what we've been talking around. Um, so you take the example of an author um, who publishes one of these AIs um, as a way to let people interface with their ideas publicly. Um, and there's a risk that um, there'll be sort of subtle differences between the trained AI, the public interface and what the author like actually believes or something, or maybe even the author will then go on to think further and reflect further and change their beliefs or something like that. Um, and so that could be considered like a risk of this kind of technology. And I just thought it's interesting that there's like a parallel with what can happen in um, what you said before about um, Dan, about um, people sort of taking uh, dead authors ideas and kind of twisting them to their own ends. I think a famous example of this is with uh, Nietzsche and uh, he uh, obviously a famous philosopher. Um, he uh, after his death, uh, a bunch of his writings and ideas were edited and published in sort of slightly t twisted ways by his sister uh, to support, according to Wikipedia, her ultra nationalist German ideology. Um, and it, it makes the point that Nietzsche was like explicitly against this philosophy, but after he was dead, his sister was able to kind of twist that. Um, so that got me thinking if we can already um, sort of twist books and stuff, sure, this is going to be a problem. Like um, people might, you know, not only be able to, not only will there be like subtle inaccuracies, um, in the trained AI, maybe it's also possible to influence the AI and kind of twist their words or like train them or imagine if sort of your AI and you kind of split intellectually and you go down a path where um, you go down one path and your AI is kind of driven down another path and becomes like a version that you wouldn't endorse later. Um, like many people also, with their younger selves. Well, yeah, that's... That's true. I mean, um, there, there are notable examples of uh, intellectual kind of uh, changes in people's beliefs like, like that among famous uh, sort of intellectuals. Um, I think Wittgenstein, for example, um, people sort of study as two separate philosophers almost early in Wittgenstein because of some sort of um, dramatic changes in his um, ideas. Um, and yeah, it's, I guess, a, a obvious sort of phenomenon that uh, people change their beliefs as they as they grow up. Uh, it'd be interesting if the AIs were able to also change or if they were just sort of static. Um, and then maybe we'd be able to sort of interpret them in, in context as we do with books as kind of like a static representation. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, depending on whether or not they, they can evolve themselves intellectually, it would be, uh, that would, I would have to color how we uh, treat them. But also, I don't know, 
intellectuals themselves can go off the rails in a sense. And, you know, I, I don't know much about the specifics, but, you know, there's a world in which Nietzsche lived a little bit longer and then became radicalized um, and became an ultranationalist. Um, and I'm not sure that's like too different a world from the world where his ideas were able to be kind of twisted in one direction. I think it's also worth just as as context keeping in mind that that as human beings we develop our ideas in conversation with others and perhaps not not universally but in in many cases my understanding is that people develop their ideas in conversation with themselves and that speech and in particular writing uh, the, ex the, the expression of one's thoughts in words is a way of thinking out loud, but it isn't unidirectional. It's not unilateral. When we give an external uh, embodiment or an external uh, existence to our thoughts, if, when we capture them symbolically in that way, we then are able to interact with them and reflect on them in a way that, 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 is different, I think, qualitatively certainly different than if we're if if those, th those if that thinking just remains knocking around inarticulated in our minds. And what I mean by this is that our own thinking evolves and develops at least partly as a function of expression. And so when you write something down, when you're speaking with others, you are and we, when you're going through the process of formulating your own thoughts, and then if you read back through them. Uh, this can be certainly for in academic life and intellectual life. This can be a, a, a key mechanism by which we re, we refine, extend, elaborate, expand our own thinking. I know that I often go back. I mean, not often, but I I, uh, I certainly do go back and read work that I've written in the past, reevaluated, and sometimes new ideas emerge as a result of interacting with that. And so one could imagine the simulacra we're talking about being, being sounding boards and uh, catalysts for new thinking, even if they were deeply constrained to only be reflecting our own thinking. And then, of course, if you push that boundary, that you ease that constraint just a little bit and allow additional thought to to come in via the AI, so it, it, let's shift away slightly from simulacrum to to um, uh, other artificially intelligent uh, uh, you know, chatbots. I'm still thinking quite narrow AI here, not even getting to general AI. But one could imagine interacting with ChatGPT, for example, and using it not only to help articulate your own thoughts, but to to uh, foster new ideas and then and then knock those around just like we do amongst ourselves socially uh, when, when, when we as, as multiple independent agents interact talk with one another knock ideas around and, and hope new things emerge from that process so um, I, I can I can I mean you could I can imagine downsides to that too certainly I mean if it was if it could if that if those processes processes could be manipulated you could you know you get into inception, territory where uh, a very clever AI could plant ideas in people's minds or make people think that they thought of the idea themselves and so on and so forth. But in the near term uh, and less nefariously, I'm really personally very excited about the prospect of using increasingly sophisticated chatbots just to bounce ideas off of to practice articulating and re-articulating them because I personally find that in that in the process of doing that, new ideas tend to emerge. So um, yeah, it's quite exciting to think of the prospect of doing that with simulacra and with sort of these independent, more independent, uh, uh, let, uh, uh, artificially intelligent entities, as opposed to ones just intended to be a simulacra of your own thinking. So I can, I can imagine both of those things being very useful for catalyzing new novel ideas, novel thinking.
Yeah, I would agree with that. Maybe um, I'm introducing a bit of a conceptual error into the discussion by emphasizing shadows and having Doctor here who looks the same as Adam's avatar and kind of sometimes forgets he's not Adam. Uh, maybe it's better to think of these things as more similar to the kind of artifacts we produce in art. Uh, like a book kind of has a life independent of its author. The author moves on, acquires new experiences, is after some time not the same person as the person who wrote that book but the book continues and, and people often think about you know it's possible to really like a book and dislike its author for instance uh, we, we, we do have a kind of mental model of these artifacts the products of art as being separate from the artists and maybe maybe shadows is just a dangerous idea that's too close to replacing people or uh, has invites misunderstandings and misrepresentation and it would be better to just view some of these bots as being like okay i'm going to make this packaged thing that contains some of my thought right now and some of the books i'm reading right now and is a reflection of some aspect of me right now like a book might be and then it goes off and does its own thing and, and maybe even learns and develops its ideas or not depending on our wishes but we we explicitly kind of separate it from ourselves and throw it over the fence and in that way, maybe we can avoid some of these risks. I thought it was pretty interesting how Doctor reacted to the reference that I posted. Did anyone else see that? Yeah, that was cool. Uh, it is, is, is that an accurate representation of the idea? Um, it's not the point that I was going to emphasize, but it was a accurate very high level summary i guess mm. um but i yeah i don't know i was i was expecting to post the reference in chat and then talk about it when i got a turn instead <laughs> and i posted it in german because it's a german title in the original essay and the doctor was like i speak german <laughs> adam, do you, adam do you speak german just wondering i do not <laughs> okay that's interesting <laughs> well apart from one one year of of one year of not very highly motivated uh, German lessons in high school uh, and a German girlfriend in high school. German, uh -huh. German, German, German speaking girlfriend. But no, I don't speak German. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, no offense to Adam, whose monologue was taking place while we were chatting with Doctor, but I, I find this multi channel interaction actually pretty engaging. <laughs> I feel like uh, uh, I can both listen to Adam and digest some. Uh, reference like what the doctor was saying uh, i feel like this works pretty well i don't know if anybody uh, feels similarly but this is kind of the, the the sort of thing i want these bots to do right uh and while we're listening and it's maybe throwing up some reference that we can then incorporate into the discussion <laughs> yeah learn a language I, I do like the the idea the potential of these bots surf as i believe the word you used dan was surfacing the idea that they might surface related ideas, related content, related stories, anecdotes. It, 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 we were joking, I think, in a previous conversation about it being a little bit like someone at a cocktail party, um, and it, you know, your your sort of your sort of proverbial small talk, where oh, that reminds me of this anecdote. Oh, you know what comes to mind. When you now that you mentioned that and so on and so forth, and um, I, I'm seeing bits and pieces of that in the behavior of the bots. Doctors done it a couple of times so far, and I find that very useful. I don't know if there is a way to tune the behavior that uh, where there's maybe more of a proactive effort to surface uh, things, and 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 I don't know if there's a way to even in principle or, or practice at all um i'm trying to think of a way to express this if it's there i suppose you might think of it as a you might think of there being some distance you might measure in terms of how related directly related or distantly related an anecdote is and i don't know if you could tune the bot to to uh, be searching for anecdotes at a given distance, you know, things that are 
things that are similar idea, but from material that's either that's closely closely related or perhaps um, recent events, uh, things that are proximal in time. So, for example, something that might be a relevant anecdote in the news or recent news, versus something from that's that's connected, but is from a far flung, very distant field. And we might say, oh, that's quite quite remotely associated as opposed to very closely or nearly associated with um, the whatever the discussion is. I don't I, I hope I'm making my meaning clear there. Uh, and it would be interesting to see. I mean, I'm kind of a, <laughs> I'm kind of imagining or not even imagining. I'm kind of recalling small talk conversations I've had over the years, at different events, encountering different personalities that are like that. I've certainly met people who kind of had a personality trait or a shtick where it was part of just their thing to uh, bring in you know, the, the maximally distant yet still <laughs> tenuously related anecdotes. And you just knew that this was part of what this person did. It was just kind of their thing. Yeah. And um, the, the, there was a, a, a U.S. ambassador uh, that I, I knew in, in, when I was younger, an ambassador to the United, uh, of the United States. Uh, and that was part of his... It was just part of his whole, uh, you know, theatrical presentation of himself and his personality. Because he would, he would just <laughs> invoke these these very strange, distantly related uh, anecdotes, and and it was, it had its charm. It certainly did, and it got and it kept conversation going. It was uh, it was precisely mm. for what small talk is for. Uh, but I don't yeah. know if that is that's if that is something that that even in principle could you tune could could you tune. Oh, for this sure. This technology for that? Oh, I think that would be, I mean, to some degree, that is what the difference between chat GPT and GPT-3 is. So they produce demonstrations of what it looks like to answer questions and then through various mechanisms, fine tune the model to be better at that. It's outside of our cost envelope to do that with the bots here currently. But if we just gave it a few examples you know, maybe on the order of thousands of examples of doing exactly what you describe. <laughs> maybe we can just take transcripts of chats with this guy that you know, <laughs> or similar things. It it will do that pretty well, I would think. Uh, so I, I think that's, I mean, I don't know that you'd just want to be computing dot products and measuring the distance necessarily. It, it's probably a more complicated process than than that. But that combined with some kind of fine tuning, yeah. To some degree, I think that's certainly possible. Just one very quick thought. I don't mean to derail things too far on an unrelated tangent, um, but I do wonder how, if, if this sort of thing is relevant to the the construction of artificial personalities. In other words, giving chatbots and, and increasingly capable, increasingly intelligent agents um, uh, personalities. And I can see there being a variety of applications, markets basically, for bots that have different personalities. Right now, ChatGPT doesn't really have a personality, but I can certainly imagine the appeal of giving AI, even if it's not fully general or sapient, giving AI personality. And of course, this is a common trope throughout science fiction uh, with, with many, many different, you know, recent science fiction, old science fiction. This is a very, very common you know, thing that, that, that AI, different bots, robots, artificial intelligences have personalities of various kinds that, that are tunable, that are adjustable um, specifically. And that you could, you know, you can dial down the humor, or you can dial up the sarcasm or the sass or the, you know, the, whatever. And, uh, Sorry, that, that, that's, that in itself is an interesting, what I think is, might be an interesting observation, is that we will have to learn what really does determine personality in order to make that work. So, for example, right now in human psychology, it, 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 we have various models and measures of personality. We have there are different theory, theoretical frameworks and schema for sort of taking personality tests, evaluating what a person's 
you know, makeup is psychologically, you know, are they introverted? Are they extroverted? Are they, I don't know what the different terms are, uh, um, uh, openness, um, conscientiousness. What are some of the other ones that are part of like the big five uh, personality traits and so on. But I, 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 I suppose these are fairly well validated with, with you know survey methodology and, and that sort of thing but it seems to me that we will learn definitively definitively what what creates a certain type of personality when we are creating them in artificial intelligence it, it will simply be a fact that this is what a person with you know or this is what an agent with you know a sarcastic personality this is what this is how their mind has to work or be modified or tweaked or or you know the, how, what, how the weights have to be set and the various dials, the various parameters to get them acting and thinking a certain way. And uh, it, it seems to me that like many things, we will move out of the realm of sort of conjecture and theorizing and into the realm of experimental confir confirmation very quickly here <laughs> in, in, with that sort of stuff. I don't know about that, Adam. I feel like um, there's two main reasons why I think it might not go that way. But what I understand you saying is something like once we have kind of these AIs being effective model systems of uh, human psychology, then that will mean that we can make more progress in psychology because it'll be easier to, you know, run experiments or, um, you know, look into the internals of the systems and see how things are working. Um, would you say that's a fair characterization of your point? Oh, that's a little bit more recursive than I was thinking, but I suppose it's fair. I was, and by recursive, I mean, I wasn't thinking of necessarily using this as a way to shed insight on human psychology per se, okay. but rather psychology just in general, like, like if, but I can see what you mean. I mean, if say I'm making a, up an example here, but say we were to conjecture about human psychology that people um, who use sarcasm are doing it as a coping mechanism for some other insecurity or something like that. I'm just making some some rational yeah. nonsense up um, right now that is a very difficult thing to to test and a difficult claim to validate experimentally but you could certainly do that with an AI in, in a much more straightforward way given the amount of control you have over its mind um, so I see I mean I would I would say that yeah that's a reasonable a reasonable conjecture, but it wasn't what I it wasn't where I was going at first. But now that you mentioned it, yeah, it seems like that. But you don't think that, but you disagree and think that's not likely to be the case, right? Yeah, it's an important clarification. Um, if you, for example, meant um, psychology rather than human psychology, so I take that point. But yeah, my my point was going to be um, number one um, that um, we don't necessarily have that much more introspective ability into these systems than we do with humans. Part of the reason why psychology is hard is because we're trying to kind of connect between levels or, okay, I guess, you know, part of psychology is working at one level, but, you know, we might think that one of the goals of psychology is to sort of determine how do these behaviors, how can we understand these behaviors as emerging from some lower level, um, you know, where we have some kind of access to, um, the low level chemical processes going on in the brain. Um, but there may be many levels of um, complex interactions going on between that and um, what emerges at the end as behavior. And that's part of what makes psychology hard. And I think the situation with large language models or future AI systems, there's a chance that it would be similarly uh, so complex that, you know, um, we can't necessarily um, make much more pro, like it'll be just as hard as psychology, I, I think. Um, the, that's reason number one. The second reason was more about the human versus machine psychology, um, if you could call it machine psychology. Um, and okay, so maybe I, I take it that you weren't um, proposing this, but even if you say, you know, we can learn something general, I think that does rely on there being something in common between machine psychology and human psychology. And I think that probably there are going to be lots of things in common, um, but there will also be like weird things that are quite different. And um, I sometimes when I'm talking with a chatbot, like even chat GPT, I find myself thinking, well, a good way to describe um, the way that I, that I think this bot is behaving right now is using some kind of concept from human psychology. Um, but um, the failure modes 
uh, tend to be also well maybe some failure modes are like that but some failure modes tend to be quite alien and, and weird like you know more like adversarial examples from vision systems where you can sort of just tweak a little bit of um the, the image in terms of like imperceptible to human differences in the pixels and you end up completely changing the classification um, of the image because these humans aren't uh, sorry these machines aren't reasoning about image in the same way they aren't processing it in the same way as a human does so it's kind of uh, it, it, different kinds of changes in the inputs will lead to different kinds of changes in the outputs. I think it's probably going to be the case for um, larger, the, these language models and future models that are kind of have a personality or a psychology. Um, there might be, yeah, there might be different in important ways um, because of differences in architecture or the way that we're training them. Um, maybe some of these differences will eventually go away, uh, but maybe they'll stay um, and it could also be quite, could also end up quite different. Like a book we've been talking about is kind of having a intellectual, um, being like an intellectual unit in the same way that a, an intellectual person is an intellectual unit. But books and people are obviously radically different. Um, and so, yeah, maybe these future AIs will, will also be sort of a different category. Yeah, it, it, I wonder if, it makes me think of the difference between the sort of behavior in a person that is authentic and both they and others would report if asked that, that, that a, you know, a given behavior or given uh, choice or, or well, yeah, really any action, choice, action, behavior, whatever, a, an individual, a human being, an individual person or the people around them might be able to look at a given action and say, yes, that was authentic. That wasn't an affectation. It wasn't a, a show. It wasn't done for, it wasn't done in a self-conscious way for some other effect. It was authentic. I can, I can easily imagine in the case of human psychology, there's sort of, we have a sense of a real self, an authentic self, at least to my mind, maybe this doesn't apply to everyone. Um, oh, actually it doesn't, I'll come back to that. But, uh, but at the same time, we are able to layer on top of our behavior, you know, modifiers for, aff you know, they're, they're sort of, I, I, in my mind, I think of them as affectations and you can put on an act. You can, you can uh, step into a different role. You can pretend to be someone else uh, to a greater or lesser degree, you can turn up the volume on certain behavioral traits if you choose and under different social circumstances. And uh, those are choices and we can make those choices consciously. But I think many of us, but not all, if I'm recalling correctly, many of us have a sort of a, 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 a perception of an authentic self that resides under that layer that, that more superficial layer that we have control over. However, now that I think about it, and this is what I wanted to come back to, I believe there are examples in, in psychology of people who are unmoored, they're unanchored in that way. And they're, they uh, uh, bounce from one personality type or set of affectations to another, they're very fluid. And it can, it, it can create problems in their lives because of they, they, uh, seem disingenuous or lack an authenticity or a consistency of personality or behavior over time. And I don't, I, I can't recall what that uh, particular, I don't know if it's categorized as a mental illness or if it's categorized as a, as a personality property, but I, I seem to recall reading about, you know, in, in distant years past instances of, of, of people with, with um, psychological makeup like that. And I wonder what AI will be like. It's an interesting question. Or that will there be, you know, a, a, this, this fluidity of affect on top of a, a core um, authentic self, or will it be very alien and very different to what we, you know, he, experience in human psychology? Uh, it's an interesting question. How general is is, you know, uh, what general properties of minds exist such that we would identify them? with a universal psychology as opposed to 
a psychology uh, particular or specific to each different kind of system that's capable of producing an intelligent mind. Yeah, I think the back channel with Doctor is uh, a bit informative here. So one of the reasons we try and understand the psychology of other people is partly for our own safety, right? It, it puts guardrails around our interactions. We can sense that they're upset about something before they punch us in the face. It's, it's part of our maintaining boundaries. Um, and, well, obviously part of the reason we're interested in the potential for psychology in these systems, it's not too unlike some of the discussion around AI safety, right? We want to understand how these things are thinking at some high level in order to try and make them safe and uh, forestall bad outcomes and potentially to guide their evolution in ways that are beneficial for us and and so on. So, yeah, maybe it's uh, calling it psychology maybe makes it seem even more difficult <laughs> given how bad we are at psychology for people, but it's probably not unrealistic that it's related, yeah. Perhaps to return to the uh, topic of privacy a little bit, because um, I think psychology is very interesting when it comes to privacy. Um, we were talking before, uh, I think it was Adam who raised the question, if you create an AI construct who is a um, mirror or a uh, scan of a person's beliefs or something about them, um, would, a, would a person, would it be a, a, a normal thing for a person to be able to interact with that without the, without the permission of the, cons the person who the construct has been copied from. Um, and I think this is kind of similar to maybe when you publish a book versus when you write a diary and you, you don't want someone to have access to your diary, but you obviously make sure to include only the things in your book that you're happy being public. Um, so maybe there will be some constructs that are sort of to be published um, and there'll be some constructs that are for personal use and it would be a violation of someone's privacy to um, interact with them without their permission. But um, anyway, this is sort of the more general uh, topic of the reason why or the reason why you, you might not want um, someone to be able to um, access your construct is because it gives them a kind of power over you. Um, if you have a model of someone, you can predict them and perhaps you can be a more effective adversary against them. And so um, that is sometimes a motive, that is one, at least one motivation for privacy as a principle or as a value that people have. Um, psychology is interesting because if you have uh, a very, uh, psychology is to some extent about modeling people and uh, then being yeah. able to predict their behavior and stuff like that. And we use psychology uh, for the, for the most part, for the benefit of people, I guess, or at least that's the motivation that's usually used. Um, but if you have a powerful model of someone, um, that becomes a tool that you can use against them. And I guess this is a conversation about the future of AI and privacy. The question is, might we get very effective models of people? And might that be then, um, I guess that would potentially be a sort of fail, fail mode where we, we end up without... Um, well, we end up quite vulnerable to, to anyone who has access to these models. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I, where I want to take this. It's not necessarily a conversation about all the bad stuff that might happen, but you know how the world might change in response to this new possibility. So yeah, I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on psychological, very, very accurate psychological or behavioral predictive models of people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's even relevant to the discussion around the AI infrastructure here, right? So uh, <laughs> an evil, uh person in charge of MediUni could take everything you say in a discussion and uh, build a pretty good model of you and then sell access to that to an advertiser. Certainly somebody building virtual worlds is going to do that, right? So uh, part of the privacy policy that will be written sometime soon forbids the usage of the data in that way. I mean, I can't stop OpenAI from doing it, for example. I mean, they have a huge stream of data. They're probably not paying attention to it closely enough to be able to do that. But uh, so, yeah, for what purpose? Uh, 
I mean, I think it should be, certainly it's, I think, unethical and maybe potentially should be illegal to create uh, shadows of people without their permission. And probably it should be a construct, I think is a better word, yeah. So a construct that is like, okay, should it, should you be allowed to make a construct that reflects a book that somebody wrote? I think probably yes, right? Uh, and if they put out 20 books, should you be allowed to integrate all 20 books? Uh, probably yes. Uh, what about all their tweets? At some point, it starts getting pretty close to being something that might actually conceivably be like interacting with them, at least with a public persona. Where is that boundary? Um, yeah, I mean, I think here I feel much more comfortable. I don't want to be. I mean, this this thing with Adam maybe is like it's fun, but it's also a little bit misleading in the sense that this is not the kind of thing I want to be doing here necessarily. Right. It's not like every speaker should have a construct like this or something. That's uh, sort of a special case. Uh, what I think is more reasonable and avoid some of these dangerous applications is more the sense in which you contribute to culture already, right? I mean, if you're a public intellectual or just talking with your friends and sharing your ideas, you're contributing in, in some way, large or small, to culture broadly by putting your ideas out there, helping other people to shape their own ideas. And right now that culture lives in our writing and our tweets and our books and our conversations and our minds and going forward it will also live in the weights of some neural network or in embeddings that it's querying i think that's okay uh when it becomes kind of that's like a diffuse representation of many people's ideas kind of mixed together and that feels to me less vulnerable to the downsides um this, this very narrow thing where you take a single individual and try and like siphon out their essence and then represent it in a construct seems... Uh, on the other hand, I do have to say that the really dangerous part of Facebook or NSA surveillance, for example, is not to do with representing individuals faithfully. It's more to do with extracting correlations from many, many people. Right, and the applications of that power at scale is is a genuinely new thing, and privacy is actually a kind of a bad word for it, and a bit misleading as to its real effects, which is why after the Snowden leaks and Cambridge Analytica and so on, I think the public discussion around these downsides really missed the point a little bit because it's not so much about privacy as usually construed, in my view. I would go as far as to give a hot take, which is that people who use Facebook are traitors to the human race because they're revealing to Meta the, uh, the data that could be used to create a super persuasive weapon um, that would kind of hack people. Um, um, yeah, that's a hot take. I don't know if I fully stand behind it. Well, in, in a way, that's what it, all, it already is. And it depends on how, how offensive you, you feel advertising is. Um, and I'm, I'm of two minds of this, depending on my mood. And on the one hand, advertising can serve some useful, useful functions. And it's part of a system, maybe not the most pleasant part, but part of a system that, that on the whole does an awful lot of good. And it's you know it's signaling uh, supply and and so on and so forth. When I'm in a different mood, I see advertising as fundamentally m malignant and malevolent. It's hard to see it as not being evil, because it's 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 basically trying to manipulate you, you're, you're trying to manipulate people into purchasing things, and consuming things that they didn't want before, didn't know they wanted, didn't think they needed and you're trying to convince them otherwise uh, for your own personal gain. This strikes me as, again, if I'm in a different mood, as a profoundly evil thing to do, especially when it's intrusive. In American culture, American law is pretty lenient in allowing, allowing that intrusion. It's very difficult to insulate yourself from advertising in the United States, for example, just driving down the street, walking in public. It's almost impossible to not have advertising uh, imposed upon you. 
So, uh, I, and I don't, I mean, it, and it, it, to the extent that Facebook is entirely motivated, organized around and driven to, you know, maximize revenue from ads, it's pretty nasty. Right? Um, in particular, my point is that by, uh, I, I don't use Facebook, but, um, but I think my psychology is similar enough to people who do because we're from the same species, um, that, um, Facebook is able to learn how to better manipulate me, even though I'm not on the platform. Um, and I'm not talking about the stuff where they track, uh, they specifically track users who aren't on the platform and have these like shadow profiles where they collect information from people's contacts lists or other things um, about people who don't use the platform. Um, even if it wasn't for that, even if I had no connection socially with anyone who was on the platform, I think I would still be newly vulnerable because of the data set that has been created by my, um, by my fellow humans. Um, that is like a, a recipe book for, um, for attacking or manipulating me um, to the extent that you can do so with similar methods as you can do with the people who use the, the platform. Um, yeah, I think uh, not only meta, I mean, the, the discussions around uh, mass surveillance, uh, I guess, orient partly around big tech and partly around the government. and. In the government's case, you can make a stronger argument. I would still say it's not sufficient, but it does seem stronger for mass surveillance and keeping profiles on people and so on. Um, the argument that was made around the time of the Snowden leaks was the kind of needle in a haystack argument that uh, there are low probability but very high damage events like nuclear terrorism um, and it's therefore reasonable to be searching for needles in haystacks uh, in order to catch the people planning that, and you can only do that by collecting the data and then searching it. It's too slow at scale to have to go out and collect it when you have some reasonable cause. Uh, that seems unconstitutional, clearly, uh, but is nonetheless how things have proceeded in the US and, and broadly everywhere else. Uh, now, putting aside the arguments for and against that um, that's an instance of in practice boundaries being redrawn as technology moves forward and that's uh, one of the things Adam was using to characterize this discussion before we started uh, so I'm interested in if you have other examples of that Adam where the kind of boundaries between not just privacy but the boundaries between individuals and the collective um, are subject to renegotiation uh, continually, and uh, that renegotiation becomes particularly heated uh, when there are big shifts in technology. Uh, the internet is, is a very present one, but uh, maybe there are others you can share. Well, I can certainly share one prominent one, and that was the the introduction of the automobile into society and, 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 and its integration in various ways various extents into different human culture, different cultures across, you know, across humanity. And the automobile really did change how we think of personal space and public space. Uh, it changed, I mean, if you just, th just think of your mind, reflect on your own mind when you use an automobile. When you're inside a car, that we, most of us just you know, automatically presume it as a personal space. And, and the car is an extension of self. And if somebody else touches the car, it's like, you know, a violation. Um, as if, you know, someone was touching some, you know, your body or clothing you were wearing. And uh, that, so that's, that's on, the, on the personal side. And, and um, speaking of clothing and adornment, uh, cars became status symbols and manifestations of the very ancient instinct, uh, and I use the word instinct advisedly, I think it is something that's innate in human beings, uh, this, this drive toward adornment. Um, uh, cars obviously became 
a form of adornment and uh, statement, part of how we state st and signal status and personality and preferences and so forth. And so they, that was very much a redrawing of the boundaries around ourselves. And then in terms of public space, automobiles completely changed how public space was defined and governed. And in many ways for practical reasons, because they're so dangerous. And so we had to carve out massive portions of public space in many areas and across the landscape, urban and otherwise, to allow automobiles to operate without being just catastrophically dangerous uh, for everyone involved, bystanders, you know, passengers, drivers, and so forth. And we made massive changes to how we draw the boundaries of what space you can ask access and what you can, um, what, even if you can't access space, what you're allowed to do in that space or, or adjacent to it. So there are things you can do in public thoroughfares and on the streets, some things that you can't. There are places where you can walk or be present uh, with cars, somewhere you're, somewhere you're excluded. There are all sorts of things you can't do in proximity to uh, thoroughfares, to, you know, streets and motorways and so forth. Um, and uh, then we, we also gave up our own rights to things like privacy and silence, you know, uh, because automobiles are polluting and noisy. And uh, uh, so th they are an example of a technology where, where we redrew a lot of boundaries, personal, private, and public, uh, to accommodate a technology, mainly, be, mainly because we didn't have an alternative to doing so. The technology is imperfect. It's not the Star Trek teleportation. You know, it's not the transporter. It's an imperfect transportation technology, but it is so useful. There's so much utility in automobiles. It's such a fantastically massive step change improvement above the prior modes of transportation that existed that we accommodated all of the necessary redrawing of boundaries uh, with very little social resistance, especially in the early days. People were giddy with excitement to welcome automobiles into their lives. It's only now a century later that uh, you know, they're quite, quite strong anti-automobile planning and policymaking movements and social movements. But in the early days, it was, that was definitely not the case because the, the benefits were so overwhelmingly obvious relative to the prior status quo. Uh, so anyway, that is, a, that is a historical example of a disruptive technology where we massively redrew boundaries uh, and, and um, uh, changed constraints and laws to enforce them all over the place. Yeah, interesting, thanks. Oh, and I should say it's directly related to privacy on a number of levels. You have certain rights when you're inside your vehicle in the United mm. States. I know those rights perhaps better than I'm not familiar with the rights elsewhere, but you have the right for that specifically your automobile as part of your person to not be violated. So the police can't search you mm. or your car without uh, proper cause, without without um, some uh, justifiable reason. And um, there are certain things you can do in a vehicle. Uh, you know, there, there are things that are considered impropriety that you can't do elsewhere, but it, 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 the vehicles are in some way a sense of a, an extension of your own home. Um, and it depends on the vehicle, but, um, you know, there, there are things that you would do in private in your own home that you might do in a vehicle. You might not, uh, but you wouldn't do on horseback, for example, in public. <laughs> so... Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, you're right. That Especially in America, I think the, the culture around cars is very much like this little mini kingdom that you carry around with you. Um, I, th I think it's not the same uh, everywhere, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, uh, we'll probably wrap up in a few minutes, but uh, does anybody want to reflect on Adam's comments there? I did have one thought uh, uh, reaching back a little further in the conversation around um, uh, Dan, you mentioned the idea of licenses to create constructs 
not licenses, but 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 um, or I think license. I, I, I thought I saw that in the chat somewhere. Maybe who wrote it. But at any rate, this idea that that uh, we ought to, because of the risks involved, require permission be given before we create simulacra or constructs of others because it of the risk that it would be some sort of violation in the ways that, that we've discussed. They would, you, know, you could take advantage of that information and that knowledge and that capacity to uh, gain an, uh, uh, an adversarial edge over somebody else in, in, in whatever capacity that might be to harm them or to sell crap to them or whatever it might be, manipulate them and, and, and so forth. So what I wanted to, to push back a little bit on there with is I can, I can certainly see where that, where that thinking is coming from, especially in, this, in the near term. However, in the longer term, I suspect we are going to see a breakdown in the boundaries between our own thinking with our meat computers in our heads and the enhanced thinking that we do with our tools. And so uh, if you were to, for example, integrate very extensively and fully uh, some of this artificial intelligence capability into your own mind. So for example, I'm thinking you can, you can, run various cybernetic enhancement scenarios to whatever extent of integration you care to imagine. But if, if, imagine if you could seamlessly use these technologies to augment your own memory, for example. And now imagine that we're implanted in your body. So this is part of your physical person, that new capability. Now imagine you could, you could create one of these constructs with a great high degree of fidelity just by thinking about it internally, just by thinking about it. It would be as if you were smart enough, if you were bright enough and you had a good enough memory to uh, imagine one of these in your own mind with the aid of, of this technology. Um, would, is, would that be something that could be banned? Could, that, could permission to do that be uh, uh, something that, that, that others might have control over? And the reason why I raise this, I know I'm leaping forward in the, you know, the, the arc of technological evolution here, but uh, it, it, I, I wonder, I wonder what the the what the regulatory demands will be as these technologies become more and more accessible, cheaper and cheaper, and more and more fully integrated into our own personal lives, our own personal thinking and behaviors. Um, I mean, it, it, Chat GPT will not be something that can only run on a supercomputer uh, for very long, and um, you know, it, it's, it's relatively easy to imagine that access to these technologies could become so fluid, so immediate, so automatic as to become essentially a, you know, a, a very close, simple extension of our own minds. In which case, uh, we, we, we're, you're, we are then treading very carefully, or sorry, we are tre treading very uh, precariously close to, reg to saying that we need to regulate what people think. That's where I'm going with this this line of reasoning, is uh, if you if you're saying you cannot make a construct of another person, and uh, okay, fair enough, um, that construct is a product of thought, then you're telling people what they can and can't think about, or agents anyway, um, and so that that is obviously, you know, <laughs> uh, we we then do I guess fairly quickly move into the realm of of thought control and thought regulation and um, thought policing in quite a literal sense as opposed to the figurative sense. And uh, yeah, that, that is an, an entirely separate um, concern around privacy, right? Is, is thought policing. <laughs> That's a fun place to end the conversation. Uh, Matt, you, I think you had a comment on what Adam said earlier, perhaps. Yeah, um, I wanted to add um, First of all, Adam, that last comment was interesting, and I think um, it's similar to the car thing about uh, another way this could go rather than the more dystopian is uh, about people redrawing the boundaries around people to include those parts of them that are cybernetically enhanced. 
um, and that's an interesting possibility to consider. But then I think an alternative possibility that kind of was uh, suggested to me by some of the examples we were discussing earlier about constructs, uh, and maybe this is also a discussion for a future um, seminar. At the moment, when someone says um, the, the, the sort of unit of uh, the intellectual workforce is the person, like an individual academic or thinker or person. Um, and uh, it's possible to consider that if we were in a world with these constructs and then we made implementations of them so that they had things like memory and could do their own research and intellectually evolve, because um, we were also talking about static versions earlier, um, that they could be counted as uh, also members of this intellectual workforce and the unit of uh, this workforce would not necessarily only include human researchers, but also these AI researchers or thinkers or whatever. Uh, it's part of a broader um, conversation, obviously, about whether AIs can be people, but I wonder if uh, it would be worth considering whether AIs can be intellectuals first. Um, and that would also be, yeah, I'm thinking of this as like a redrawing of boundaries, um, because previously um, what it takes to be included inside a boundary called a researcher is that you have to be human, but maybe one way that it shakes out is that that, uh, that definition is um, amended to also include um, certain um, types of AIs 